Hi, this is Meg Riley here in Minneapolis, and you've joined us for another episode of The View. This morning, I want to make a special call out to all of us who love people who are on Caribbean islands, understanding that most of them and the people of Puerto Rico do not have um, access to electricity, are not listening, but many of us are connected to them and thinking of them, as well as the people in Mexico City and all of the people in the world who are dealing with extreme weather. So just to, just to say we're holding so many people in our hearts, it's, it's, it's epic. I also just want to, before I sign, I'm going to be quiet today because people are pounding on my house. But I also want to really say, if you have not spoken out, called, stood in the streets, fought for health care, Watch our show from a few weeks ago. It's critical. It looks like Tuesday is going to a vote. Uh, another horrific, inhumane, hateful bill um, playing political football with people's lives. So speak out. I'm going to be quiet today. I'm going to turn this over to Michael Tino, co-host. Thanks, Meg. Hi, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. And we'll let uh, Asia Hauser introduce herself before we introduce our many guests. Hi, I'm Asia Hauser, and I'm in Seattle, Washington. So today we uh, we have a whole full lineup of guests, um, and we will be talking about um, the white supremacy teach-in part two. Uh, many congregations, most of our congregations, uh, by a fair bit, participated in teach-ins on white supremacy and white supremacy culture in Unitarian Universalism in uh, the spring. And the, um, the group of folks who organized those teach-ins um, has, has come back with part two. Um, so we, uh, we have several folks who are on the, the resource team, um, creating resources for congregations, and several folks um, who um, will be participating in part two and had wonderful things to say about what happened the first time they went through that. And, and of course, those two groups are not mutually exclusive among our guests or even our hosts. So let me introduce our, our giant panel of guests. Um, Asia Hauser is, uh, uh, is both a co-host of The View and also one of the lead uh, organizers of the White Supremacy Teach-In, parts one and two. And, probably three, four, and five. Um, so, so she's going to be doing double duty today. Uh, we also have with us Aisha Ansano, who is the ministerial intern at First Church in Boston uh, and um, part of the team of folks putting together resources um, for the, the teach-in. Tracy Brenneman, who is a religious, re religious educator serving two congregations in Westchester County, New York, one of which is the congregation I serve as minister. So Tracy and I uh, work together as a, as a ministry team. Um, that's uh, in Mount Kisco, New York. And Tracy also serves our congregation in Hastings on Hudson, New York. So welcome, Tracy. We also have with us the Reverend Josh Pollock, minister at the UU Society East in Manchester, Connecticut, and the Reverend Krista Taves, consulting minister of the Unitarian Church of Quincy, Illinois, and the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of La Crosse, Wisconsin. And uh, Krista and Josh um, were uh, two folks whose experiences with um, the first white supremacy teaching um, we wanted to, uh, to particularly hold up. We do not have yet with us, but we will be joined soon by Christina Rivera from Charlottesville, um, Virginia, uh, a, a friend of The View um, and uh, often our guest on many different topics because she is so wonderful and interesting. But Christina is also one of the lead organizers of the white supremacy teaching, so she will be back with us this week. So with that in mind and all of our guests, um, Asia, do you want to tell us a little more about um, how we've moved from part one to part two? So um, we, there was such a tremendous response to part one. Uh, Two thirds of our of our you know 1,200 member congregations participated in one form or another, and so one of the things we had set up a Gmail uuteachin at gmail.com, and people had started emailing saying, "Hey, we want to keep going. Here's how what we're doing." And then 
uh, Kenny, Christina and I met and we had already decided that we would do something. We weren't, you know, we hadn't yet formulated it would be a part two, but uh, we did have beat in August and I did bring up the question. I said, you know, the words white supremacy, are we going to do this again? And and Kenny, without missing a beat, said it worked the first time. So yeah, we're going to keep. So he was right. And I said, okay, just, just wanted to do due diligence because I know I'm going to get that question from folks and I have. Um, and so it, it just felt like this is a model, especially, I mean, Charlottesville, what's happening. This is our opportunity to continue to look at how, what white supremacy is, how we're all a part of it, and how we can dismantle it. And so um, I, I was really, one of the things I want to lift up in terms of Krista and Josh is one of the realities of white supremacy is white people listen to other white people in a different way than they do people of color. It's not great, and it's also reality, but I appreciated their advocacy. Um, and one of Krista's posts, and we finally met at General Assembly, I actually used in my congregation uh, because it was just so uh, on the nose and and pushing people and, and basically telling people, yeah, this is uncomfortable and this is what we need to do. And one of her lines is, yeah, are we gonna lose people? Maybe, and this is still what we're called to do. So I'm really appreciative of that. And and so, uh, yeah, this is a great panel and I'd love to hear from everyone's experiences. And Krista, since I brought your name up first, why don't you start <laughs> after me? Is there something particular you want me to address in my opening well, comments? I'd love to know. I'd love to know how your teaching went and what response did you get and what kind of pushback you got or not, you sure. know, just your basic experience. Well, um, I've, I've done one, one teaching. At, I serve two congregations, and the first one I did the teaching at the Unitarian Church of Quincy, Illinois, which is a very, very small town, 96% white. The congregation is pretty much 100% white, maybe 99% white, and um, also a congregation that has uh, for quite a long time been quite separated from the association. So not part of a lot of the dynamics that have been going on in the last several years around race but a congregation that really has wanted to re-engage with the association and not really quite sure how. Um, I was very heartened when the white supremacy teaching came that someone in the congregation went to the board and said, we have to do this because this is the kind of congregation that is less likely to take that direction from a minister than it is from its own people. So I was waiting to see whether the impetus to actually do this for white supremacy teaching would come from them or whether I'd have to find a way to introduce it myself. So I was very pleased that it came and it went right to the board and the board said, yep, we're going to do it because we had also been doing beloved conversations last, last winter. So there was a whole, you know, there were 13 people in a congregation of 75 who were ready to, to, to do something concrete. And this was some, a way for them to bring what they had been learning to the congregation. So that was very, very helpful to do. And so I, I was very intentional about building a team of people within that congregation who were going to work with me to do the, to do the, the, the service. And um, one of the choices I made pretty early on was around how I was going to engage the, 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 the question of using the word white supremacy. I got pushed back from the very beginning about using the word white supremacy. And yet there was also a strong message from those of you who were preparing the materials for this to use the word white supremacy. So I wanted to balance. I had to find a way to honor what was being asked, but also do it in a way that it could be heard there. And so that was that real delicate balance that I worked with. So I actually chose not to put it in the title of the service. I chose to put it in the write-up after the title. And then I spent quite a bit of time at the beginning of the service as a white minister speaking to white congregants about the shame response that comes when you hear words like white supremacy and how to understand that shame response as a response to internal trauma that comes from the impact of white supremacy on white people. And I, you know, I don't think this is the job of people of color. This is not fair to ask people of color, but it is our job. It is the job of white people to find a way to create the conditions for other white people to hear about white supremacy. So I spent a lot of time at the beginning of the service planting those seeds of, you know, um, I, I really dug into our um, universalist theology where there's no room for shame. That shame is not, you know, we're not, I'm not asking you, I'm not telling you that we are bearers of white supremacy to make you ashamed. 
you have nothing to be ashamed of because we are all oppressed by this system. We've all been indoctrinated. So when you feel that shame, it is actually the tool of white supremacy meant to shut you down so that you can't do the work that we're asking you. So it's almost like if you're in therapy, I kind of see it as, I mean, we were in a big therapy session that, um, okay, you're going to feel shame. Here's a helpful way to respond to it so we can move beyond it. So all these things that we're going to talk about, hurtful things, harmful things that we have all done, when you feel shame, put yourself on notice. Give yourself permission to move through it so that you can keep hearing what's happening. So that's what I did, first of all. And then after that, most of the voices in the service were from people of color. I got videos. I wanted to have real people saying the words. I did have to, um, I couldn't find any videos of Kenny Wiley that, I, that fit in the service. So I, I did have someone read his words. Um, but uh, mostly I tried to use videos from GA worship services or things like that, music things like that. So that first, so basically what, what I first did was lay the, lay the groundwork and then introduce the voices that I hope they'd be able to hear. Thank you, Krista. Uh, before we ask Josh to talk about his experience with uh, white supremacy teaching part one, I want to note for those of us who are watching live, we see Christina Rivera has joined us from Charlottesville, Virginia, and I want to welcome you to the show and give you an opportunity just to say hi to folks. And um, uh, anything, anything you want to say as, as introduction to, uh, to this topic of, of part two? Oh, gosh, where to start? So hi, everybody. Christina Rivera. I am a religious educator serving as director of administration and finance at uh, the UU congregation in Charlottesville. I'm also on your UUA board of trustees and secretary to the association. And I'm super excited for our teaching too. Um, I, I want to hear from everybody else because I was on The View last week talking a little bit, but um, definitely want to give a shout out to um, the rest of the collective that is working so hard on all the materials. I know everybody wants them. I'm going to remind everyone, however, I went back and looked at the dates. So last year, or last year, earlier this spring when we did the teach-in, we launched the teach-in on March 28th, and our first teach-in date was April 22nd. So we are doing great <laughs> uh, for a uh, timeline. Everybody, if you can just remember this time last, last uh, spring, we're doing awesome. You're going to do awesome. Uh, the materials will be there, and we will all work through this together. Thanks, Christina. Um, so we're we're starting just by talking about the the experiences we had with our teach-ins in the spring. And um, Krista uh, told us told us about some of the things she challenged her congregation with. Um, Josh, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what you did in uh, in Connecticut? Sure. Um, I, uh, I first I, I want to say I really liked hearing what what Krista had to say. I don't I don't know if I went at it quite in the same way. Um, I, I think in some ways our congregation was, which is a very white congregation, was was definitely prepared to hear a message about white supremacy in our congregation and in our faith in Unitarian Universalism in part because we had spent the previous year talking about Black Lives Matter and doing a, an internal process that resulted in the congregation voting uh, not not a not to just put up a banner, but a, a a vote that we support the Black Lives Matter movement. So, to to some degree, people were primed, and um, I, I have a, a, a certainly a history of of talking about institutional racism and talking about racism in the church. So, um, people were somewhat ready, but I don't know that I was ready to 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 use the the language of white supremacy to refer to us. And I was very grateful when the when the when the white supremacy teaching was launched because I realized oh that's that's going to be an opportunity to finally really name this and name it uh, partly because people of color Unitarian Universalists are are naming it and if we're going to be accountable then then it's it's time to name it so I was very grateful that to have that opening and people 
in the church were not so aware of the white supremacy teaching, but they were aware of the hiring controversy last February. They were aware when Peter Morales resigned and people would come to me and say, hey, so are we, what is this about? Are we doing anything about this? I said, yeah, we're gonna do the white supremacy teaching because really this is about white supremacy. So I, I, I was able to get some conversations going in the congregation ahead of time. And on, on uh, I think we did it May 7th and really what it what it was was a sermon and it and it was a sermon that i preached that that made the case that white supremacy isn't just something that's out there that the neo nazis do and the klan does and that if we uh think that that's what it is or if that's our if that's our assessment uh then shame on us because then we don't really understand how white supremacy works that and 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 then said some things I think similar to what Krista, Krista was talking about, but basically said, this, this is about us too, and we need to be aware of it, we need to be vigilant about it, and we need to be working on ourselves to decenter whiteness and start to bring into the center the, the voices of, of people of color um, into our worship in, and into the congregation. And I, I have some, some awesome experiences, at least from my perspective, that came out of that. I don't know if we're ready to move to that, but I, I definitely want to share some things that came out of that. Okay, well, I want to hear from uh, Aisha and Tracy, um, and then, um, and Christina, too, but we'll get, we'll get to the things that came out of it. Um, we have a lot of voices that we want to get in today. So, Aisha and Tracy, I know that you um, both are on the team of folks putting together resources, but I imagine, I know Tracy did twice. Uh, Aisha, I imagine you also participated and or led uh, teach-ins uh, in the first round of, of teach-ins. So um, I, we'd love to hear your experience with this, Aisha, and then uh, Tracy, too. Yeah, I was, so I'm the ministerial intern, one of the ministerial interns at First Church in Boston, and we did a worship service that was really a collaborative um, process between three of our ministers um, and really shaped a service drawing very heavily on the resources that came out, which was really great. Um, and then um, I work with the youth group at First Parish in Arlington as well. And we did more of a workshop with the, with the high school youth, which was a really different process and a really different experience and also really wonderful. And, so part of being involved in pulling things together this time is, is having been able to draw on all those fantastic resources and not having to start from scratch the two times that I helped do the teaching. And so I'm excited to get a chance to help pull together more resources to, for people to do it again. Thanks. Tracy? Um, so in Mount Kisco, um, we also had been engaged in uh, long-term internal conversations about Black Lives Matter and, and Banner, and um, we had been weaving the work through some of the other programs that we were doing. So we were already um, committed to anti-racism, anti-oppression curriculum with the kids last year, uh, and so we already sort of had some groundwork to work from. Still, we, like others, encountered some resistance to the word supremacy. And uh, so for the service, Michael and I did it a little bit later because we wanted to both be there for it. We wanted to be part of it. And we sort of then worked up to it. So we started with, it was sort of a, a service in three parts. We started with privilege and then talked about systems and culture and then went into supremacy. And then gave them time in small groups to talk uh, during the worship service. And the neat thing is that when we said, it's time to come back, the response was, wait, we're not done. We want to keep talking. And we thought, that's a great place to, to be. Um, in the other congregation I serve, it was a very similar format. I was not there for it. I understand that it did not go quite as well. Um, there's still a little bit of um, groundwork to be laid. I think, um, and I'm thinking about that for some of the work that we'll do in the spring, uh, and I can talk more about that later. Uh, 
Excellent. So, so Asia, um, you have posted some articles recently um, that uh, we will link to in our YouTube uh, uh, video of the view. So, viewers, you can you can see those articles. Do you want to tell us a little bit about them? Yeah. Um, one I was written by a Jewish woman, um, uh, basically speaking to other uh, Jewish folks primarily white Jewish people, and really lays out beautifully how to be an ally in this movement. So one of the ways, this is my opinion, that uh, white supremacy shows up in liberal spaces is when we center ourselves, when white people, not white people center themselves. So there was a letter recently that UU World posted, signed by, um, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen UU ministers who I declared, and it looked like they were all ordained clergy who identify as Jewish. So the letter itself was basically asking folks to, um, to me, it almost felt like, you know, an entry in the oppression Olympics. It was like, hey, we're oppressed too, and there's anti Semitism and there's hate. And so, and in fact, one of the lines said something like, we have to lift up all oppressions or all hate, and all was in capital letters. And I almost was like, oh my God, all lives matter. And I felt to me, it felt like a missed opportunity to say, what we're talking about here is not general hate. That is, you know, you can go to the Teaching Tolerance website, you can go to the Anti-Defamation League, the AC, there is a lot of resources out there that absolutely address hate, because um, there's a lot of it, yes. What the white supremacy teaching is about and what we're lifting up and what we're focusing on is state sanctioned violence against black and brown people. That there are there is not mass incarceration of Jewish people. There is not police do not pull over people for being Jewish, nor are they shooting people in cold blood for being Jewish. I apologize if that sounds insensitive. I totally understand the knee jerk. Um, emotional response to the Nazi flag. And in fact, this, the article speaks to that, that yes, this is absolutely emotional. And one of the lines in it is, don't make no mistake, the Nazis are coming for black people and they are targeting black and brown people. And so here's an opportunity for white liberals, white you use, no matter how you identify, to decenter yourselves and take the, and this is also in the art. I mean, I wish, you know, I read it and I said, wow, I wish this, this was an article our folks wrote. She says, take the lead of black people, take the lead of black and brown people, of women, black women, and listen. Please resist the urge to center yourself because this is how white supremacy shows up with well-meaning white liberals, is well-meaning white liberals want to center themselves and their pain and their oppression. We all lose in the oppression Olympics. So let's not, let's not enter there. Um, the other article is written by Kendi, uh, Abraham Kendi, and he wrote a book called Stamped from the Beginning. And he, uh, Meg actually not, gave the synopsis even better than I did. So um, hateful laws don't come from racism and hateful ideas. The hateful ideas and racism come from the laws that are enacted. So the laws are enacted that create institutional racism and justify slavery, and, and this is, through hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and then people derive those hateful hate, hate, hate and racism. And so those are two excellent articles that I, and we're actually gonna include them in our resources for the second teaching. So Christina, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> well, um, so I was not present for either of the teachings of the congregation I serve and the congregation uh, that my children participate when I was at uh, Revolutionary Love for One. Um, and also, you know, at that point in time, I thought it was good for me to step back a little bit and and have um, other folks in leadership do this work. Um, so what I did do was uh, just recently go back over the survey. So after the teaching was done, um, we did we sent out a survey to folks to try and get responses and you know see where we needed to take the next survey. Um, so I wanted to share with you all just a couple of snippets of that survey. Um, so one of the questions, the impact of the teach-in questions was um, the teach-in increased my knowledge on the topic of white supremacy. And it was very um, carefully worded to say white supremacy. And so 82% 80, agreed with that, with that statement. 
so clearly there was a desire for the teaching and then an impact. Um, and the second one I wanted to, there's a lot of questions, I won't go over all of them with you. But the second one was, um, I feel that the teaching increased my effectiveness at addressing white supremacy in my own communities. And this one was really, really important, uh, at least to me and to us on the Organizing Collective, um, to talk about um, uh, the effectiveness of the teaching. And so that was 75% strongly agreed or agreed with that statement. And then um, the third one that I would lift up is, um, the reason why we're here today is I would like additional opportunities to increase my ability to address racism in my own communities. Um, so pre-teaching, that was 80%, which is great. Post-teaching, that was 90, almost 90%. Um, so you can see by doing the teaching, it wasn't like everybody was like, oh, I know what to do, everything's fine now. It actually increased people's um, hunger and desire to be able to be effective, right? So that's really why we're here now um, to continue to doing this work. It's not, uh, we didn't think at the time it was gonna be a, a one and done. Uh, we didn't know if we were gonna have the bandwidth to do it again, uh, but clearly once we saw those results um, and then when we saw what was happening, um, you know, in Charlottesville and now St. Louis and, um, uh, you know, Charlotte Uprising, I mean, you could name any number of, um, of things that are going on in the country right now uh, to say that this is the right time for teaching too. Yeah, I think that's it's really um, great that you did a survey. I love, I love that there's actually numbers that you can, that you can point to to say that. I mean, certainly in, in my case, it's a qualitative feeling that I get from the congregation. That, that doing the teaching really made them want more education on this, on this topic. It wasn't like, oh, good, we're done, yay, white supremacy, uh, next topic. It actually really did feed a uh, hunger for, uh, for, for understanding uh, white supremacy and um, being involved in dismantling it however we can, which is, which is great. And, and I have to say, you know, we, this is part two, we're calling this part two, uh, that's coming up because it's sort of the national part two. But uh, here in, in Westchester County in Mount Kisco, um, we had kind of parts two and three over the summer. Um, unlike some UU congregations, we, we worship all through the summer and our folks didn't want to let this drop in May. So we actually had two services in one in July and one in August on, um, you know, more civil rights history with regard to white supremacy, and then another one that, that I did on, on white fragility uh, using the work of, of Dr. Robin DiAngelo in particular, um, to kind of priming people to, you know, how, how we can react to being told that we have a white supremacy culture uh, in a way that, that invites further discussion and invites further learning rather than uh, gets defensive. And so thank you. the one thing I would add um, to folks is, particular to here in Charlottesville, is I don't know if, we, if our congregation would have had um, the foundation to respond to the white supremacists and Nazis that came August 12th without having had the work that they did for the teaching, right? So the teaching gave them this congregation and congregations in our area a sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about white supremacy versus what we're talking about when we're talking about white supremacists, right? And that was a big pushback that we got from, from everybody. We got it from Peter, <laughs> for gosh sakes, of, you know, are you calling us, um, you know, a, a faith of, of Aryan nation? What, what are you saying that we're white supremacists? And so, you know, I, I, the universe, God, however you look at it, really, I feel like, put that in our path so that this congregation, when we knew uh, the Nazis and, and alt-right and white supremacists were coming in August, man, they were ready to go. They, they didn't need to, you know, uh, fall back 
um, to to examine, you know, what our white supremacy means within that. They knew that this was very different um, things that we were talking about. So some folks mentioned um, things that their congregations and folks learned and wanting to, to talk a little more about that. And um, I also want us to get to what we're hoping uh, folks will get out of part two, um, what, what kind of ways uh, we hope our congregations will, will, um, will engage with this teaching this fall and the resources that are, that are being created by this fabulous team. So, um, so I'm not sure exactly who to, to, to toss it to, uh, to first, um, uh, Josh, I know you mentioned you wanted to talk about some things that your congregation learned in particular. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about those things? Sure. Um, I think you, you, you could, you could do a white supremacy teach in and, um, like doing a, a mission statement. If you don't, if you don't use it, uh, it it could just go away, and I think in uh, a very white congregation, um, people could be very attentive on that particular Sunday morning. And if you don't keep the, I'll call it a drumbeat. If you don't keep a drumbeat going, um, I think it's very easy for for amnesia to set in and for people to forget. Oh yeah, we talked about that. Um, I think that's always one of the risks with with, with these things. That's one of the reasons I love the. I love that we, we've got white supremacy teaching two coming, and I'm hoping it'll 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 just continue. I'm actually going to be on sabbatical starting in a week, so I'm not going to be around for white supremacy teaching two. Uh, Jan, Reverend Jan Carlson Bull, who's a, a, a Unitarian Universalist minister in Meriden, Connecticut, is going to be our preacher for that day. But I'm I'm hoping to do one in the in the spring. I'm hoping we'll have white supremacy teaching three. Anyways. Uh, we didn't. We didn't do in our congregation a great job of of pre-planning. What would the drumbeat be after the white supremacy teaching? What would the organizing be after the white supremacy teaching? But a lot of ideas started coming at me from from parishioners, and um, one of the ones I like the best is um, that we participate in this. Uh, it's it's called Imagine Main Street. It's a it's a community. Uh, it's an opportunity for different organizations in the community to have a table on the street downtown. They close the street. Uh, they do it once a month in um, in uh, in Manchester during the warmer months. And so people come. They they walk up and down the street or roll up and down the street, and they they come to your table. And the and the organizers of Imagine Main Street like to have the the different groups that have tables and are promoting themselves do a craft at that table, so it becomes kid friendly. They want kids to come to the table. And people said, you know, if we're going to, if we want to decenter whiteness, how do we do that at our table at Imagine Main Street? And the idea emerged that maybe we should partner with some local artists of color um, to help promote their work uh, while we're promoting our work. And in fact, we also uh, uh, realized along the way, like if we're, if we're going to, if we're, if we support Black Lives Matter as a congregation, maybe we definitely need to have our Black Lives Matter banner at our table. So we we didn't we didn't we weren't able to do this at every um, to partner with an uh, artist of color at every Imagine Main Street event. But we we did it some of the time. And um, in June, for example, we worked with a guy who's based in Hartford named Joe Young, who's a he's a cartoonist and um, he's actually had a show called Scruples. It was a uh, was on television in the '90s, but he runs a summer camp for uh, kids in Hartford. And he, he really wanted to work with us to promote his camp um, over, the, over the summer. So that, that felt like a way. Here we were at our table downtown promoting ourselves and, and attempting to decenter whiteness at the same time. I'm not, I don't know that it, it was done perfectly, but that, I love that people brought that idea. One other thing that I want to share is that uh, the congregation is ready to do a new vision statement. And um, someone after the white supremacy teaching, one of our leaders came and said, so if we are a, a largely white congregation and if our leadership is, is centered in whiteness, if we do a vision statement, 
with our white leaders, isn't that going to just be a white supremacy, a, a white supremacy vision statement? But they're saying by your logic of your sermon that that's the case. And and they were right. They're absolutely right. So the idea we hatch the idea to before the leadership does its visioning process, this um, it's actually happening next weekend that on the, the Friday night before before we're going to have a, a panel of local uh, activists of color, people in the Black Lives Matter um, movement, Moral Monday, Connecticut, some local education activists come and just speak about their experience of our larger community and what they think is uh, important for a congregation like ours to be envisioning. Be so before we do the visioning as white people, we're going to hear what people in the community think is important. And we're also talking about not, you know, not getting into dialogue, not getting it, certainly not getting into arguments, not pushing back. Cause I'm sure some of the things that we're going to hear are going to be things that we're going to have a gut reaction to. Oh, well, that's not us. Right. Um, we, the, the goal is simply to listen and to be grateful that people are coming and are willing to come and talk to us partly because they believe in us. They believe that, that we're a church that actually can make a difference. So that, that, is not a complete decentering of whiteness, but it's but it's a it's a it's a movement in the direction of decentering whiteness. If if you don't have a sufficient pool of leaders of color in your leadership team, here's a way that you can hear and and center center the voices of people of color before you make a major major decision. So that came out of the white supremacy teaching. I was unexpected, and I was very proud that that people had that that idea. So that's Thanks what I wanted to share. Sharing that, Josh, and I love when people prove that they've been listening to what we're saying by, by asking questions like, hey, if we do this, won't, won't this be a vision statement steeped in white supremacy culture? D didn't I hear what you, what you were saying? I mean, it's just it's such a wonderful thing. And I just, I took notes on that because we're about to start a visioning process too. And I love asking the question, how do we make this not a white-centered vision, uh, vision statement or vision process? Um, I know that uh, several others here have had the um, opportunity to do more than just a Sunday um, around uh, this topic and to really um, present it to the congregation in different ways. Tracy, do you want to tell us about some of the things that you've been doing? Are you are you there? You look a little I'm here. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so we're trying to bring this lens into everything that we do so that it just becomes part of everything that we're talking about. Um, and with the conversation, for example, now that Kim Sweeney has opened up about the future of faith formation at the death of Sunday school, we're doing work leading up to that. And in the spring, when we talk about the future of faith formation, in our congregation, that's going to be a, con a conversation about not only adult centric Sunday morning, but white centric, our systems and practices. And, and if we really want to reimagine the future of faith formation, then we need to be thinking outside those systems and we need to be trying to, to reimagine something different. And I really appreciate what Josh just said, because I've been thinking about the same thing as a white person doing this work. You know, I, I need to step out. I need to bring in other voices, other uh, experiences, centering those to help frame the way that we go about the work. Um, and, and being thoughtful about that, I think, is really important. So, but for us, you know, we've, we've just been trying to normalize it in terms of everything that we talk about, this is going to be a lens. This is going to be something that we bring into it. Uh, and especially in Mount Kisco, I think that really helped them be open to the teaching the first time around and over the summer and now in the fall and when we get to these conversations in the spring i'm really excited about the possibilities and i think it's important what to lift up what you both what you're lifting up is it's not going to happen without being intentional because one of the ways i think we've been operating as you use as well-meaning liberals is that because we're well-meaning and we're personally not racist or we personally have people of color in our lives and whatever then that's enough and we, and and the stru changing the structural piece changing our attitudes is going and envisioning i love that josh and and tracy what you said is it takes intentionality and it takes using the correct words 
Um, and so thank you for that. And Krista, I do, I like, uh, Krista, you had mentioned something about um, if you can briefly tell us about the white supremacy embedded in the architecture of your church, I think is fascinating. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I tried to do is to make it very, um, very immediate and very present how white supremacy shapes how Unitarian Universalism is done. Um, and in the, the Unitarian Church of Quincy has a lot, it's, it's a 170-year-old it's a year old congregation, and there's, there's pictures, stained glass windows around the building, and one of them features William Penn at the very center. He's the biggest figure in the picture. Mm -hmm. Then all around him are, are Native American men, smaller in stature, sitting around in various poses looking at him. And so that became like a very clear example of this is how white supremacy is embedded in the iconography of your church. People are going to walk in and that's what they see. How is a person of color going to respond to that image? And at the very front of the sanctuary are, is a picture of an Indian mound, which is in the, the city of Quincy. And the people who built the sanctuary like over 100 years ago saw this as a way of respecting and honoring Native people. But I said, where are the Native people in your community? And this is a place where they are buried. All you have here is an image of a place where Natives are buried, which is now a park where people go for walks with their dogs. So, you know, right there, you have basically held up that Native people are part of your history, but not of your present. There's no relationship with Native people. So how is something like this honoring Native people, it's not actually honoring them. And yet this is at the very front of your sanctuary. What, how are you going to hold yourself accountable for the image that you're presenting? And then we went through the hymnal. And we looked at how the hymnal hymns are identified. And we looked at the way the principles are ordered. And said, you know, these are all manifestations of white supremacy. So you have surrounded yourself with your hymnals, with your principles, with the iconography in your sanctuary, you have centered whiteness in, at every step of the way. So how are we going to hold ourselves accountable for that? So I, I just made it really that, real. I just brought it, I, I brought it home. Yeah. And we don't all have racist, but right? we all have hymnals. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a really concrete thing. Like we can all, page through the hymnal and, and see those things. And I just want to offer a concrete response and, and, and helpful way to decenter whiteness with the principles. Look up the Black Lives of UU principles, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism principles. Thank you for saying that, Krista, because that can be a, huh, what would the principles look, look like not, decent, not centered in whiteness? Oh, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. And Aisha, you mentioned working with a youth group. I'm wondering if there are other things that um, you've been able to do in your in your ministerial internship, or that you've seen done uh, that that took this took this concept and this teaching and um, spread it beyond one worship service. Yeah, I think one of the things in my internship that worked really well is that we have a really really strong social justice community and group and that is completely congregant run it's not spearheaded by the minister and i think there is chrissy you had said earlier you know things coming out of the congregation can be really powerful and i think so we as ministers planned the the worship service and, and crafted and created that but the social justice group was actually meeting after that service it was their regular meeting and they chose to watch and discuss briefly um, one of the men's lectures, which had recently been posted um, online. And so these were Mark Morrison Reed and Rosemary Bray McNatt gave these really beautiful lectures about Black Lives Matter and Unitarian Universalism. And they, they, they had happened a month or so, two months previously, but they had just come out in video form. And so they decided when they heard that we were doing the teaching as our worship service, they said, well, we want to focus in on that and watch this and think and talk about it. And I think they already were thinking and thinking about ways to talk about 
I don't know that they would have used white supremacy, but certainly to talk about race and to talk about Black Lives Matter. And I think this gave them an, uh, a way to focus in a little deeper on something and, and have some things. And I think, you know, we we're talking about intentionality. I think that idea of too of, of what resources we provide so that it's not only you know, the, the religious professionals, the staff people who are choosing these things, but we put out enough resources that social justice groups or people who have done beloved uh, community or congregations or all these things, people can say, oh, this is here and we want to draw from it and do our own thing with it. I think that that's a really important piece of this, that it, 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 it's meant to be accessible beyond just the staff of the congregation. And I think that was one of the things in working with the youth group too, was that we as the staff presented it, but, you know, shared with them articles and, and thoughts that they could then talk about or bring up. And now as we're shaping programming for a new year, there are little pieces around that people can pick up and, and work with. And now more resources are coming. So I'm imagining um, right now that there are some folks listening or watching The View who have just heard that the, princi the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism can be seen as uh, furthering white supremacy and are going, ah, I love the seven principles. They're wonderful. They're the foundation of my faith and, huh? So I'm wondering if maybe we want to spend like just a minute or two <laughs> giving an example. Um, is, is there someone? Is there someone who wants to uh, wants to take that on? Giving, giving maybe Krista, since you did that with your congregation, or Tracy, since you've been actually doing that with our youth, Krista. Well, I I looked at the order of the principles, and that we start with the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And that in a white supremacist system, whites are trained to see themselves first as individuals and then as part of a group. And our seventh principle, which is the last principle, is the, inher is the interdependent web of all existence and that radical interconnectedness. And so um, when we start with the individual, that is a manifestation of white supremacy, that we are self-created individuals. And then I, 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 I have started in my own theology, I start with the seventh, and every single principle is reflected through, through, and has its meaning through its place in that interdependent web. So that you start deconstructing the idolization of the individual that we have in Unitarian Universalism. And that idolization of the individual, I think, is, is, is what stands between us and really being, for whites, being in true solidarity with people of color. Oh my God, my, the first principle has been my pet peeve since I've been a Unitarian Universalist and I've, Kenny and I have gone back and forth about that, but I completely can hug you right now if we weren't a thousand miles away apart because I wish we could just actually get rid of the first principle and go to the seventh, I mean, the, make the seventh the first one and then the eighth principle should be this, you know, throw that in, uh, that, that project. But I think the first principle has, people have used it as a weapon. Well, I have inherent worth and therefore I'm not vaccinating my kid and therefore I'm not going to say God and therefore this is why I want you to do what I want. It's been incredibly destructive in, in who we are. So thank you for that. Tracy, did you have something to hold up on this topic too? I do. Um, a couple years ago, we were in deep conversation in our region about um, the game Cards Against Humanity. Uh, being played at youth events, and um, the willingness to hear the voices of people who were saying that that's not okay for me when that's brought into the space. And at, at different points in the conversation, some of the principles came up, uh, one of which, for example, was everyone has a voice in our appreciation for the use of democratic process, which sort of got turned into, we can vote on this, and if most of the people want to do it, Right. So then we had to take a step back and look at, so, so then where are our UU values in that in terms of making sure people are heard and in terms of honoring the, the needs and voices of marginalization 
Uh, and, you know, we can't use our principles to further oppress and further marginalize. And then another conversation that we've been having a lot, especially with our middle school and high school youth when we do covenants, um, and I appreciate Kenny brought this into a workshop that he led uh, a couple years ago, bringing that into youth space since. And that's on covenants, one of the common things that we see is uh, assume good intentions. And we need to also take a step back from that and, and ask ourselves um, to look at impact. We can't just talk about our intentions. We have to talk about the effect that our actions and our words have on people. And so, you know, when we're doing covenants in classrooms and especially with the older kids and when we start moving from behavioral covenants to relational covenants, it's really important for them to think more deeply about how our values are reflected in the ways that we're carrying our faith forward. Thanks. So, yeah, this is a really rich conversation. We could probably have a whole show on um, the, the white supremacist uh, institutions and language that our principles refer to, um, right? The democratic process. What does that mean in the United States? Like, who's, who's allowed in? Who really does have a voice uh, in, in determining uh, how things get decided? Uh, and I'm aware that we have nine minutes left to talk about what we're most excited about in White Supremacy Teaching Part 2. And we haven't heard your voice in a while, Christina, so do you want to start us off on that? What are you most excited about? So um, I promised on my little promo for the view I would uh, give folks a sneak peek. So um, everybody watching the view right now, if you go to the uuteachin.org uh, website, there is the first resource has been posted for the Teachin 2. It is an assessment tool for um, leaders of congregations to use to figure out which track you're going to take once we have the different track materials on. Uh, one track is kind of spirituality worship, one track is um, education based, more, um, and then one track is more activism based. I'm not sure if those are the titles we're going to use. Um, and uh, shout out to uh, Julika for um, providing this for us. She has a shout out in the material for the other folks that she based this um, assessment tool on. And she's going to do a quick little video for us about how to use it. But you can absolutely start now, go in there, take a look at it. It really does a great job of breaking out, like, what are the characteristics of your congregation and where are you in your um, anti-racism work, and, which would give you a really great start to trying to start to think of how you want to focus um, your white supremacy teaching, too. So um, get the sneak peek. It's there now. Go check it out. Aisha? Um, yeah, I'm excited that it's happening. I'm excited uh, getting anecdotally the emails from folks uh, really appreciative that we're continuing to do this. And I have hope for our faith in a way that I really haven't. I mean, I've always had hope for our faith, but this the, to be relevant and to really live into begin to live out the values uh, that we espouse. And so I'm, I'm actually leading a teaching at a different congregation. I haven't led any in mine, and we had actually Robin D'Angelo do ours in the spring, and I wasn't even in the building because I was such a lightning rod uh, because people were angry at the words white supremacy, but it, it you know, we're on a journey and we're gonna keep, you know, it's opened a lot of doors. As everyone said here, it's just opened a lot of doors. And so I'm super, su and I wanna lift up Kenny Wiley, who's not on the show right now. and. Um, He's just amazing and brilliant. And I have to say, Christina Rivera did 110% of the website work. So thank you, Christina. None of us are getting paid for this extra work. Aisha, Tracy, there's a team of like 25 people. <clears throat> and we're all doing this in addition to our full time plus job. So thank you, everybody. And I, I want to mention this. A number of us have mentioned Robin D'Angelo. Um, who does some really great work on white fragility and who was a guest on the view last year. And so there'll be a link to her show, um, in, in our YouTube as well. Um, we, we suggest you watch that. 
Aisha, uh, you're on our uh, resource on the resource team. Do um, you want to tell us about what you're excited about and maybe a little bit about some of the resources you're pulling together? Yeah, I think one of the big things that's been exciting is to watch people start signing up, to start seeing those congregations roll in and to think, you know, I, I'm excited about folks who did it and are doing it again and the ways in which people can go deeper and then maybe congregations that didn't do it the first time. Um, Maybe having heard about it and thinking, okay, we'll, we'll give it a try. Um, that's really exciting. And I think along both of those lines in pulling together resources, um, both things for people to go deeper and things for people still um, just, uh, just figuring it out. So yeah, as we're pulling together, I'm working especially with the resources for worship. And there are a lot of uh, similar similar resources to last time, fantastic readings and information about um, hymns and hymnals. And actually, Krista, based on what you said about showing videos, I'm now actually really excited to find a few videos to to put in the resources that people can can draw from. So yeah, I think just finding more things for people to keep going just a little deeper and pushing just a little harder. Nice. And Tracy, you're also on the, the, the team pulling together resources. Do you want to tell us what you're excited about? Um, so um, I've been helping, and I'll be helping more, Aisha, to work on the uh, education resources. And one of the things that I'm thinking deeply about right now is ways to sort of bring some of the tracks together because I think that for white people, especially focusing on education and intellectualizing sort of creates opportunities for distancing. And so thinking about ways that, that if we're doing education, that we're also thinking about then ways to get active. And if we're engaged in action and we're out there, then we also need to be thinking about ways to step back and reflect on the work that we're doing and keep learning and be in relationship and be accountable. Um, so I'm thinking about a little bit in terms of the, you know, weaving those pieces together. Um, and I'm just glad to be, uh, that the conversations are continuing. Nice. In Westchester County, New York, we have five, UU congregations, and we're trying something new. We are doing a five-way pulpit exchange. Um, so the five the five ministers and one intern are exchanging uh, pulpits, and we are all talking about environmental racism um, because we have congregations that are very uh, deeply involved in environmental uh, issues, and so we're we're using their commitment to environmental issues uh, as a way to to talk about. What, how white supremacy uh, even affects people's um, environment and health. So we have we have five people all preaching on environmental racism in somebody else's congregation on October twenty second. Is it the twenty second? I don't have my calendar in front of me. Twenty fifth. Um, it's late October. Uh, <laughs> Um, so do we have any last words from, from Asia or Christina about, about this? Go to uuteachin.org, and that link will be on our thing, Christina. Yes, please sign up. Um, one thing Asia reminded me yesterday is if you signed up uh, for the last teach-in, you need to sign up for this teach-in. Even though you're on the mailing list, we need your congregation on the beautiful map that we have that has little chalice flames of all the teaching sites. So we want to, you know, set the place on fire for the, for the white supremacy teaching, but we need you all to sign up. Yeah, if one of our ministerial colleagues can put that on the UUMA listserv, that would be super terrific. <laughs> and ask folks, I think we have right now 90, Christina. Meg's asking how many, yeah. And so we were at over 600, almost 700 last time. So let's let's get back there, folks. Excellent. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation with many interesting and exciting and beautiful guests. Um, next week, we have uh, the next in our semi-regular check-ins with Blue, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalists, uh, D.D. Delgado and Michael Slack will be joining us on, on the show. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, what's going on with Black Lives of Unitarian Universalists. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next week.